a great franchise comes with a great rivalry. Marvel has Iron Man and Captain America, Physics has General Relativity and Quantum Physics, and Bayes and Stats has Posterior Estimation and Bayes Factors. A few months ago, I had the pleasure of hosting EJ Wagenmakers to talk about these topics, and this time I'm talking with George Tendero, who has a different perspective on null hypothesis testing in the Bayesian framework and its relationship with generative models and posterior estimation. But this is not your classic clickbaity podcast, and honestly, I'm not interested in pitching people against each other. Instead, you will hear George talk about the other perspective fairly before even giving his take on the topic. George will also tell us about the difficulty of arguing for papers and all the nuances that you lose compared to casual discussions. But who is George Tendero? He is a professor at Hiroshima University in Japan, and he was recommended to me by Pablo Bernabeu, a listener of this very podcast. Thank you very much, Pablo. Before moving to Japan, George studied math and applied stats at the University of Porto in Portugal and did his PhD in the Netherlands. He focuses on item response theory, specifically person fit analysis, and of course, Bayesian statistics, mostly base factors. He is also passionate about privacy issues in the 21st century, an avid Linux user since 2006, and is trying to get the hang of the Japanese language. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 69, recorded September 1st, 2022. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Pandora, like the country. For any info about the podcast, learnbasedstats.com is la place to be. Show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS on Patreon, unlocking Bayesian merch, everything is in there. That's learnbasedstats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.andora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbasedance.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen. Maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming. How would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like I'm Richard Feynman? Jorge Tendero. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you on the show. And um, as is becoming a custom, this is thanks to a listener who sent me um, an email and brought your uh, work to my attention. And that was really cool. I, I have to, I'm really bad with names, so <laughs> I have to find <laughs> that listener. I will find you, dear listener, and properly thank you in a few minutes. But yeah, let's continue, start the episode. And as usual, I'd like to start uh, with your origin story, George. And basically, how did you come to the stats and data worlds? And like, was it a sinuous or a straight path? I did a bachelor in mathematics. And... I basically did it because I loved math throughout all my schooling, so I wanted to continue. And when I finished my bachelor's, actually, I still worked one year as a high school teacher. Data science, statistics was completely not in the horizon at all. But after that year I worked in high school, I really didn't like it because I don't think I'm suited to teach uh, 10 or 12 year olds, which is what I was doing. So I decided to come back and I then I chose an uh, applied statistics master's program. And then things started to happen for me because I actually, when I started, I wasn't that motivated or driven. But as I proceeded uh, with my studies, then I started to get uh, enthusiastic. And then I, I just got deeper and deeper and I never got out of it. <laughs> yeah, I like to hear these these origin stories. So like from the beginning you were you were really interesting interested in, in, in math and 
But how did you, like, how did the focus on stats happen? I knew after doing my bachelor in math that I did not want to pursue pure math. I knew that 100% for sure. So I, from the stats courses that I had in, during my bachelor, I thought that I will try uh, statistics, more applied work. So it's possible when doing statistics, doing a little more theoretical or more applied, I always have a bit a foot more on the theoretical side and then application uh, comes usually second for me. And throughout the years, even this has changed a bit. So that's how I didn't want to do pure math. I don't think I would be able, I, I would not be very good at it. And then statistics was, that's why I told you that when I started my master's, I wasn't really convinced. I was try, was going to give it a, a try. And then um, it was when I started to do it that I realized, hey, I actually like this much more than hardcore pure math studies. So I started a bit by accident, perhaps, or as a second option. And then quickly I was gained. Can you define the work that you're doing nowadays and especially the topics that you're particularly interested in? Yeah, so, well, Bayesian statistics is one of the main topics that I'm thinking about for a few years now. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I can mention, namely the base factor. So for hypothesis testing in the Bayesian world. So I have been doing some work on that for, for the few last years of my career. And before that, I actually was not doing anything with, with Bayesian statistics per se. I did work within item response theory, specifically person fit. So I worked on these techniques that you use when given a data set, how to identify uh, persons that work through tests or questionnaires in ways that are not orthodox. So either because they cheated or they make too many mistakes at the beginning or too many mistakes at the end, or they had too many easy questions uh, wrong, but uh, too many difficult questions correct. So I studied techniques to identify these strange answering patterns. And this is called person fit in item response theory. And before that, during my PhD, I did something also completely else, three-way component analysis. So... And that has been something, also for my master's, I did something else, uh, clustering. So I have been changing topics as years go by. And uh, it's a bit always looking for something that I like, that I'm interested in, and that I still have a drive to do something about. Right now, Bayesian Statistics has my full attention, and I think it will have for years to come. Well, actually, can you tell us, like, how you first got introduced to Bayesian methods and, and how they... And why they they stick with you? For me personally, I started to have more contact with Bayesian statistics only when I started my PhD. So during my bachelor and my master's back in Portugal, I was not introduced and I, I didn't really pay attention to it. But then I started my PhD and I moved to the Netherlands to uh, Groningen to do my PhD. And then I started to pay more attention because I started to attend conferences and talks and, and uh, seminars. And of course, there were people presenting things about base. So I was starting to be more interested, but I did nothing with it. What happened then was that we received a new colleague at my psychometrics and statistics department at the time in Groningen, which was Richard Mori. So Richard Mori joined us, I don't remember exactly when, maybe 2011, around 2011 he joined us. And he stayed for perhaps three years or so. And, well, Richard was my colleague, so I had much more opportunity to learn more and to talk more about Bayesian statistics through Richard, who, had, you know, gave talks, would write papers that I would read. And I have to say, and um, he never tried to change my mind or to convert me in any way. Uh, what Richard tried, of course, is just to explain in the way that he does, a very good way always, why, in his opinion, uh, it's such a plus to, to go the Bayes way. But it didn't stick to me. <laughs> What Richard did, and he has no idea, or at the moment he had no idea about it, uh, all he did was to plant this idea in my brain. And I didn't do anything with it. He left, eventually he left to the UK. 
And it was roughly one year after he left that things started to make more sense to me, where I started to be more sensitive to the fact that I was teaching, and I still teach, frequentist statistics, confidence intervals, p-values, classical null hypothesis testing. And my dissatisfaction for it was growing each year to a point where I was really feeling really uncomfortable, that I was teaching something that I knew that it was fundamentally flawed in many ways and that would fall short in many ways. And about one year after Richard left us, then I thought, okay, this, I know that there is another alternative. I know that there is another way. Maybe I should pay, spend some time looking at it and trying to do something about it. And that's how it started. After that, I never stopped. I started to read and have discussions with some colleagues. And then one thing followed the, the other. And here I am. You said also that um, you always like to relate the statistical method to the applications. So is there a, like a special field uh, where you pay particularly attention as to how the, the methods are applied? Or is there like particular applications that you uh, that are dear to you? Uh, things like that? Well, that is a very good question, considering what I have been working uh, lately. Mm -hmm. As I said, I'm working on the base factor. So I'm considering the base factor. And what I have been doing for the best of the last year is trying to understand how practitioners are actually applying the base factor, are using the base factor in practice. So before, and I suppose we will be talking about that uh, in a minute, I have studied and did some theoretical thinking about the base factor as an instrument, as a tool to try to learn and understand it. Then, this is what I'm interested in now currently, I try to see how do people actually use it in practice? Mm -hmm. Do they understand it? Do they make similar mistakes as people are used to make when they use null hypothesis testing with p-values? Do they make, or is it actually very intuitive? Do they actually, on average, do it very well? Is there really a substantial difference? And this is my best answer to your question. Currently, I'm trying to see how people actually use it, having before, I have before gone through studying it and trying to learn the best that I could learn from it. So I always try to have one foot on each side, indeed. Let's talk about that now. Like, What, what can you tell us about that uh, recent work of yours, about how people use base factors, the, the intuitive mistakes that they make, or uh, how intuitive it is for them to understand, especially compared to p-values, for instance? Like, I'm, I'm curious about that. I can tell you, this started actually with a project. It was a bachelor thesis project still in my previous university in Groningen. And my co-author on several of my base factor papers, Hank Kears, supervised that project. And actually, that turned out to become a paper that is now available in Calabra. So uh, Wong was the lead on this project, and he actually started. What I'm doing right now is an extension of what uh, Hank and Wong and myself, I also joined the project at some point, what he did. So I can tell you that that preliminary uh, paper uh, project that Wong worked with, together with Hank and myself, he studied a set of around 70 papers where the researchers were using the base factor to test hypotheses, to compare models. And he had already identified uh, several problems. For instance, people mistake confusing the base factor with the posterior odds. Or, for example, people using the base factor to make an absolute statement about one of the hypotheses, completely ignoring the fact that the base factor is meant to compare one to the other. For example, making statements based on a base factor, making con uh, deriving conclusions based on an effect, then it was established that the effect exists or that the effect does not exist based on one computed base factor. So... This kind of using usages of the base factor, in my own opinion, and I have a very strong personal opinion about this, I think these usages span from okay-ish, you kind of, maybe you can get away with how you're doing that, all the way to, that's just wrong. 
that you, you should not do that because the base factor does not l allow you to, to do that. And I think there is really a continuum here. And depending on what we have found, some things are more serious. Others are almost a writing style, how people write their papers. For example, what do people report? Do they report everything they used to uh, render the value of the base factor? Do they report which priors they use and how they, if they, present, for example, ran a sensitivity analysis to try to see how sensitive the, the hypothesis comparison is to the prior? Not everyone reports the same stuff. What I'm doing right now is an extension of this. So we did a, a larger literature uh, research and we included more criteria to try to understand the behavior of researchers applying uh, the base factor. And this is a project involving the same people from the first project, so Wong and, and Hank. And also Rink Hoekstra is uh, taking part of this project as, let's, I would call him my frequentist expert. And Richard Mori is also on board, and I would call him my Bayesian expert. So we have a team of five and we have been through a bunch of papers and we had several meetings to discuss our results and, and very importantly, to try to understand why those behaviors occur. We try to understand what is leading people to use the base factor in sometimes non-optimal ways. So we speculate a bit, why is this happening? Not just we found something, but why? Are we finding this so much? Uh, okay, super interesting. So, like, let's get concrete here. And like, can you talk about those, especially those, mm, the, the category of misuse? Like, what should people not do? Right. How to solve that, maybe? And lately, why this kind of stuff happens? But first, yeah, like, uh, lay the groundwork for us and like, tell us uh, what are the kind of things that people are using base factors for that you think they should not do. One of the things that I find a lot is people really interpreting the base factor as if it were equal to the posterior odds. Now, this is true as long as we assume that the prior model odds are equal to one. And in that case, indeed, the base factor and the posterior odds are exactly equal to each other. What I think is that we have no... Ab Can you quickly define what the posterior odds are? are for people and also sure well, maybe what the base factor is you know like what how you can interpret it normally when we want to compare two hypotheses or compare two models in general what the base factor allows us to do is to compare the predictive ability of those two models so once we observe data what the base factor gives us is a ratio probability of the data under one of the models divided by the probability of the data under the other model. And by doing this, we use basically the data to indicate which of the models is be best predictive for the data that we observed. So for example, if when, when I compare the null hypothesis to an alternative hypo hypothesis, if the base factor is equal to five, then that means that the data that I observed are five times as likely if the null hypothesis is true than if the alternative hypothesis is true. So it is a comparison of models by means of how well do they predict the data that we observed. What is the posterior odds? The posterior odds is also a ratio, but it's a ratio of the posterior probabilities of both models. So if uh, after observing my data, if one model has a probability 0.6 and the alternative model then has a probability 0.4, this ratio, which is 1.5, I think, indicates that after observing the data, the upper model is 1.5 times more likely than the lower model. And now with the posterior odds, we're talking about uh, probabilities of the models directly. But for this to work, we need prior odds. We need what are the probabilities of both models that we stipulate before even observing the data? What is the probability that we think each model has? The base factor converts the prior odds into the posterior odds. So how the formula works is that you pick up prior odds of, let's say, the null model versus the alternative model, multiply that by the base factor, and you get the posterior odds as the result. 
So there is a fundamental difference between the base factor and the posterior odds. So the base factor is a ratio of probabilities of data under either model, and the posterior odds is a ratio of uh, probabilities of uh, the models, given the data that we observed. They happen to be the same only when the prior odds are equal to one. So if when we run the test, we assume a priori that both models or both hypotheses are equally likely, then the problem is gone. Then indeed the base factor can be interpreted as posterior odds. But that need not always be the case, of course. We may have already accumulated enough evidence in prior research in the literature, or we may, we, we may have a very specific belief that is not a 50-50 belief. And in that case, we need to incorporate that. We need to multiply that particular prior odds by the base factor to compute the posterior odds. So what, have, what has Wong found and what am I finding all over again now? I am, um, or we are finding that I think either people assume that the models are equally likely a priori and they don't even write it in their papers, or they, it's possible because we, we don't know for sure, we need to ask people why do they do it like that. It is also possible that they just mix up the base factor with the posterior odds and they, def, they think it's basically interchangeable, that it's the same. And this is the kind of discussion that we are having. So technically speaking, when people report the base factor, they should report, you know, interpret it as a ratio of probabilities of data under either model. That's not what a lot of people are doing. And um, the point we are trying to make is that for clarity, it's important to be a little more verbose in the paper, just for the reader to be completely sure of what researchers are trying to accomplish when they use the base factor. And this is one example, one of the problems, or it's not clear enough how people are doing this. I mean, that reminds me of like, <laughs> like be careful when you interpret a p-value, for instance. And it's like, if you like, if you start like cutting some parts of the sentences that you're supposed to put in, like it changes the, well, the interpretation. And if that interpretation becomes something that people always do, then it becomes the new one. And it's clearly a problem. I understand. So thank you uh, very much for that. Like, very clear distinction between the two posterior odds and base factors. I know it's a bit technical, but hey, from time to time, we do have technical episodes in here. And I do think that um, that listeners will will like that. So that's one way base factor is, is kind of confounded with posterior odds. And the way you think to solve that would be like to be more explicit in how, in, in what the prior odds are, or is, is there something else that uh, you would recommend? For this particular case, for this particular example, yes. I think that would go basically all the way. If, if authors would say something like, given what we know, state of the art, all the literature that we have analyzed, we have no strong, a priori, no strong preference of one hypothesis or one model over the other. That's a prior odds equal to one, then carry on and compute the base factor. It will be equal to the uh, posterior odds by your own belief. So I'm not talking much here if you think about it. It's just a little extra words, a little one extra sentence perhaps in the paper just to clarify this so that we don't need to speculate. But are they equally likely a priori? Are they not equally likely a priori? And that would completely clear the question. So... This is one of the suggestions, of course, that, as you can imagine, that we, we will provide suggestions in, um, after our analysis of the data. And of course, one of the suggestions is the easiest. I think it's, it's the one that can solve most of our problems. Be a little more detailed, even if you don't put it in the paper, maybe in supplementary material on, you know, on the journal's website. But provide a little more detail as to how you set the whole thing up. And then it'll be much clearer what you did. I have a lot of questions here. I, we could go into like a, a few more examples of like the difficulties in in how to interpret base factors and so on. But uh, maybe let's get a bit more general because you recently published an article actually advocating for posterior estimation as an alternative to base factors. And that's actually the, the paper that the listeners sent me to like make me aware 
of your work, and I, I found the name of that listener, so it's, it's uh, Juan Bernabeu. Thanks a lot, Juan, for uh, recommending me George's work. And can you talk to us, can you tell us about that paper? And in particular, what do you win and lose when you switch from posterior estimation, from, sorry, from base factors to posterior estimation? Well, first of all, I would not say that that paper, so this is the paper published in Psychological Methods. I would not say that that paper I defend like estimation as an alternative to base factors. That's not exactly how we think of it. Mm -hmm. I think that, so base factors testing, testing, comparing uh, hypothesis and estimation serve different purposes. And both me and people that did not agree so much with the paper we wrote, I think we all agree with this. Testing and estimation really serves different purposes. So in my own view, I think they complement each other. They don't replace each other, really. So I would not go as far as saying that people shouldn't use base factors, they should use estimation instead. What I will probably say, and here I might already lose some people, is that, in my opinion, we test way too much. And base factors are eminently the Bayesian testing tool that uh, psychologists are using these days. I think we test too much. We dichotomize too much. We use black and white decision-making, even when we don't need to, too much. I think estimation and using estimation to express our uncertainty about uh, model parameters, also for model comparison, of course, I think would really help us. I think we should stop this black and white way of doing research. We have option A, option B, which one shall I pick? We don't always need to pick one of the two. And this is what turns me off when it comes to hypothesis testing, either frequentist or Bayesian. And that, yes, in that paper that you mentioned, we did mention this. We test too much. An estimation actually provides answers to questions that are different, necessarily different from testing. But in terms of expressing our uncertainty and describing the, the world we live in, estimation is, is, is crucial and offers answers to questions that testing just does not fall short. That's why I have such a, a big fancy for estimation. I understand. And yeah, interestingly enough, like on a personal level, that's how I was introduced to stats in a way, because I did a bit of, of stats during my bachelor's, but not with computers. Like it was pen and paper. So I'm not coming from a hypothesis testing framework. And so I was first introduced to inference through a Bayesian inference. And so posterior estimation was my first tool, if you want. And indeed, yeah, like I do notice that a lot, especially in, in people who come from frequentist background, where it's like, if you cannot test, the method is worthless in a way. <laughs> it's like, we have to test something. If we are not testing a hypothesis, we cannot say anything. And um, that's always quite puzzling to me because I really don't come from that same background. So it's always interesting to to me to, to see that um, like that reflex need for uh, for testing. And I'm not saying it's always useless, but I'm saying that, yeah, I get your point that sometimes we absolutely want to see every problems as uh, testing problems. And it's like the age old adage, like if, you, if all you have is a hammer, you have to see every problem as a nail. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Like I found that very interesting. And so like concretely, you just said that we should not see every problem as a hypothesis testing problem. And that's what you say in this paper. And as you were saying, like some people, and in particular, E.J. Wagenmacher, uh, Wagenmacher yeah, who was on the show here, I will put the, the episode in the, in the show note, like he and someone else, I think it was uh, Van... And Don. Yes. Don van Ravenswijk. Yes, yeah. exactly. Actually, Don was the first author. Okay, yeah. And so they responded to the, the paper just mentioned by you and your colleagues. So before you, you talk about your rebu your rebuttal, can you like generally genuinely tell listeners about their concerns 
about what you were saying. And then one last thought to complement what I was explaining before. In that paper, what we did was, it's kind of an X-ray uh, for the base factor. We picked the base factor, which at the moment was still a relatively new instrument for me and Hank Kears, who I wrote the paper with, mm -hmm. and we scrutinized it. We looked at it, we read a lot of literature, we really read dozens of papers to try to learn from it and see what others were saying and how they were thinking about it in theoretical, from a theoretical perspective and how it should be used. We read a ton of stuff. And then we decided to write a paper, which it could have been titled uh, Base Factor, an X-ray. <laughs> That's what we did. Well, Don and Eric Jan are, for, for several years now, strong defenders of uh, both Bayesian statistics, but very in particular of the base factor. And um, when they, and Don at the moment, he was my colleague. So he was in the same department as I was. And so he knew, of course, what I was writing with, uh, with Hank Kears, and um, they didn't agree. I remember once talking with uh, EJ at a conference somewhere in the US, and I actually discussed with him what was about to become the preprint of that paper. And I told him, look, I have a list. We studied the base factor. I have a list like with uh, 11, I call them issues, which is a word I'm, I'm a very careful now to use uh, from now onward. I have 11 issues on the base factor. And I went through them one by one with EJ between sessions, uh, having a coffee somewhere. And of course, I, I remember that he didn't agree with me on everything, of course, because uh, EJ is very fond of the base factor. And, but sometimes he would say, well, I see where you're coming from, but I actually disagree because of this and this. And we went through the 11 like that. But one thing is, was that, and the other thing is when the paper came out. And when the paper came out, Don and EJ decided to uh, write a rebuttal. And they wrote a paper where they picked up the same issues that we identified. And one by one, I think that what they did was try to debunk them. What we called an issue, according to their point of view, it's not an issue. It's either, I believe Don said it was either a neutral or a salient advantage of the base factor to be like that, for the 11. So of the 11 issues we identified, they pretty much gave us nothing. They didn't see any disadvantage at all. Actually, some of them became advantages and not disadvantages. So obviously we read their rebuttal with a lot of interest because I knew that it was coming. So we read it with uh, interest and we simply did not agree with most of the arguments that they set forward on the matter. So we have really different views on this. It's very interesting that when we talk in person about it, and I have talked with, uh, especially with Don, I've talked many times about this topic uh, in person and online since I'm here in Japan. We seem to agree more when we talk than when we write. And this is a phenomenon that I have never met before. Uh, it's the first time where you can actually, when you have a conversation, you can kind of organically understand each other. Even if you don't ag uh, agree, you kind of understand the reasoning. But when you put it black on white, the message changes a lot. And it becomes really a, a football match, a competition. Like, this is what I think, but this is what I think. And then there's a clash. And we are not talking anymore. There's really no time to try to convince each other of our, of our positions. Everything has to be written down. At the end, you know, after reading the rebuttal, me and Hank still don't agree with most of the arguments that they use. I think, to some extent, we will never agree on many things we have discussed on those papers. And this comes to show, I think, just how complex, for example, the base factor as a Bayesian tool is. It's not as straightforward or as intuitive or as peaceful as sometimes one might think by reading some papers that are out there. You know very well the, the big discussions for decades that we have about p-values how misinterpreted, how abused, how used, misused, and abused they are. I'm coming to realize very quickly that the base factor, if not used, uh, or if people don't think a little more carefully about it, might become the 21st century p-value. If people are not careful, and they don't spend a bit of time to absorb it, to really think a bit what it entails, where, what are the, the, the borders beyond which you should not go. I am really uh, afraid that uh, 
psychologists might actually hurt themselves more than help themselves by making a shift from using p-values towards using base factors. And this is uh, something we also disagree because uh, I believe Don and EJ, at this moment, if they were here, they would probably say, well, even if people don't understand the base factor that well, using the base factor is definitely a plus compared to whatever use of the p-value they could have done. And I frontally disagree with that. I think whatever you use in, you know, whatever research you're doing, whatever you use, you should understand minimally what you're using. And in this case, the base factor is what people should understand. So thank you for that background. That, that's really super useful. And can you then quickly uh, tell us about like what they were concerned about? And, and then you can like, because you, you, you kind of told us like a bit of, of your rebuttal, but can you also be a bit more precise about what sure. they were, what they are concerned about? I think one of their biggest concerns, mm -hmm. it's like a meta concern. I think they, because they, they, they mentioned it in their rebuttal. I think they were afraid that a paper such as mine with Hank could turn people off, not motivate them to make a change from null hypothesis significance testing towards uh, null hypothesis Bayesian testing. So they were afraid that the way we wrote our paper was too critical and perhaps unfair towards the base factor. This was definitely a strong feeling uh, that Don and Eric Jan, I'm, more, I'm pretty sure they had. Obviously, at a more technical level, we disagreed on things. For example, one of the 11 issues that we introduced was the sensitivity of the base factor to, uh, with respect to the prior distribution under the alternative hypothesis if we are comparing against the point null. And we mentioned it's an issue. And an issue meaning pay attention, because if you change the prior, the base factor will change with it. Mm -hmm. This is our view. It's not like... We did not say, don't use the base factor, because it depends on the prior, stop using it. We didn't say that. We just say, remember that it depends on the base factor, on the prior, I'm sorry, and better run a sensitivity analysis just to make sure that your result is robust enough. And in the rebuttal, if you see the paper by Don and Eric Jan, they actually think that sensitivity to the prior is a pronounced advantage. Because, in their opinion, a model should be sensitive to different prior specifications because different priors elicit different models. So if the base factor were not sensitive to the change of uh, priors, it wouldn't be sensitive to the change of the model, then it wouldn't be functioning well. I think, in essence, this is uh, how they would say that it's actually advantageous that the base factor depends, is sensitive to the prior. And... For example, on this particular example, on this issue, I see where they come from. And most likely, they see where we come from. It's, it's, it's a mathematical fact. You change the prior, the number, the base factor value will change too. I see their point of view. I understand that the prior is part of the model. So that the base factor takes that into account does make some sense. Above both of us, what I would like is that people at least understand it's an extra factor to take into account. When you compute a p-value, there's no prior there. You don't even have to think about it. But if you go to the base factor world, there is a prior. So you have a new element that you should think, should consider. That's all that we said about it. Probably you can pick up this example and multiply by 10 or by 11, and you will see how uh, the, our papers follow it. Uh, one paper follows the next. That's really super interesting. And I love that, that discussion. And yeah, I agree that like, I mean, usually talking is uh, like leaves more space for nuance, you know, like you can say more words, you have more, more time in space. And so you can be more nuanced in your, in your thinking. So I think that's also why you agree more when you talk than when you, right. than right. when you um, write. And, and also you can see the other person and understand that some word written may seem harsh, but actually when the person say it, you, you understand that it's not an attack or something like that. Okay. And of course, like I'll put, so your paper and the answer of EJ and Don and also your rebuttal of their answer in the show notes. And EJ was there in episode 61. This episode was more 
focused about like frequentist hypothesis testing and Bayesian hypothesis testing. Uh, of course, it will be in the show notes for people who are interested in that. And so I'm actually like wondering if with that project that you just talked about, it seems like a paper that took some time to set up and write. What's the main difficulty you encountered, if any, <laughs> with that project? And what did you learn for, from it? Like it's, it's more of a meta question. Yeah. So I, uh, just to make sure I understand, you're, you're referring to this exchange that we yeah. had with... Uh, yeah. At some point, for me at least, it became almost an emotional thing because I didn't like it at some point. I like talking about pretty much anything. And I am wrong on a regular occasion. I'm not always right. So I give myself some latitude to admit that I am wrong. In this particular case, you use the word nuance. That's exactly it. I mean, I don't think there's a right and there's a wrong per se. I think nuance is important. There's a lot of gray in the discussion that we had or the, ex the papers exchange. If you read them, you will understand that they're, um, yeah... I don't think it's uh, right or wrong. So what I learned the most from this exchange is that controversy can arise very quickly just because of this. We, we work in statistics. It's not pure math anymore like I used to do before. In pure math, you have a theorem. Either you prove it holds or you find a counterexample. It's as simple as this. If you prove something is true, it will be true forever and ever. If you find a counterexample... It'll be false forever and ever. In statistics, there's a lot of room, you know, gray area for interpretation. It depends. It depends on how you approach. It depends on your purpose. It depends on what you want to do. And that's why I think I'm not necessarily right. I don't think uh, EJ and Don are necessarily right all the time. It depends. And it, how we lay out the arguments, what I learned the most, this is something, of course, I knew, But I was firsthand involved in such a discussion, and I value more now the subjectivity and the nuance of knowledge of what we do in statistics. It really depends on context, on belief, on interpretation. It's extremely hard to maneuver in statistics waters, and I got a new appreciation for this after this exchange. Yeah. Highlights again that priors are very important, and um, it's based, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like uh, often, like you can. That's that's why people can see the same data but uh, come to different conclusions, right? They have different priors. Yeah, and I also like these, like highlighting these kind of discussions because uh, it's something I I try to do a lot with this podcast. Is also helping people see and understand that uh, science is not something, you know, outside of the realm of humans. It's a human story. And so it's, it's very important and it makes it also more relatable because you relate more to a story than to a theorem. And I think that's also a way to make people more interested in, in science and scientific reasoning. And actually there is a Podcast, uh, uh, yeah, uh, an LBS episode that was released just today. Uh, what we record, David Keeping, episode 67, where we talk exactly about that science education and uh, also probability of life in the universe. So, one of my favorite episodes. Uh, so, guys, if you if you missed it, I really recommend it. I'll put it in the show notes. Cool. Uh, so. Time is flying by and I still have a few questions for you. And like, let's make it a bit more general now and forward looking. So I'm wondering, in your opinion, what do you think are the biggest hurdles in, in the whole Bayesian workflow currently? For applied researchers, like in the social sciences, there's still a, a thick technical wall. People need to know much more how to program and how to code to use Bayesian methods in a very efficient way. We now have programs like JASP, which help tremendously, which really, at a few clicks away, people can do so much now. But I still think if you really want to get your hands seriously dirty into Bayesian modeling, there's a set of tools that one needs to learn. And those, those are hurdles. You need to know perhaps a language like Python or R, Then you need to learn something like uh, Stan or Jags. 
And then you need to know everything that it entails from um, preparing your data, the priors, tuning your samples very well, analyzing your results, making sure you converge. It's a lot. So naturally, the Bayesian machinery is complex. Luckily, the advantage of those who decide to learn and to go through it is the tremendous power that it brings. It's extremely power, uh, a powerful inferential tool. But I still think even nowadays, um, in 2022, with graphical user interface as spectacular as, for example, Jaspis, that this is probably still the biggest hurdle. And you have to think that most people learning about these things, they are not undergraduate students anymore. They really have careers, busy life. They cannot just say, oh, I'm going to stop for a couple of months just to learn this new way of doing inference. It's difficult. You cannot learn really in a couple of nights if you want to do it very well. I would highlight that still. Let's see how things will progress. Uh, for example, JASP is just getting better and better. And hopefully it'll, you know, shorten this bridge between a practitioner who wants to learn and getting to the point where they can do it efficiently and well. That's a recurring topic where this is this is a, um, a set of very powerful skills, but as a lot of things that are worth it in life, it, it requires effort and time. And so like there is definitely this balance of, uh, yeah, like time investment. And also the fact that like in research, open source contributions, for instance, are not really something that are that are rewarded and incentivized. So, like, you, like the here, there is also a problem of incentive alignment. And so, yeah, for sure, that's that's something that's very important. We've talked about that already in a few episodes of the podcast. Also, in the other format that I have for the patrons, especially the so the matchmaking dinner uh, that I had with uh, Dimitri Pananos and Ravin Kumar, I think we talked about that a lot. And also episode 35, I think, with Paul Bjorkner, uh, the creator and maintainer of BRMS. But that's all. I'll, I'll put that in the in the show notes. So before closing up the show, I'd like actually to ask you about, well, the future of Bayesian stats. What does it look like to you? And more specifically, what would you like to see and not see? Well, they are really complementary of each other. I would like to see inference used one once for you know for once I would like to see it being used well. We have been butchering since the 1920s. We don't seem to be able to do it right, uh, you know, massively. We cut corners and we uh, we just bluntly make mistakes out of ignorance, sometimes on purpose. What I would like in the future is to see a research world where this is the exception and not the rule. I think for a hundred years, it's fair to say that we have been really butchering through it. Now, uh, the Bayesian, let's say Bayesian statistics for the last 30 years since MCMC became revolutionized uh, Bayesian statistics, it's gaining traction, becoming more and more important. I hope for the best. And with all the open science tools we have now, we can share code we use in our analysis the data that we used, I hope that everything combined as a pack means that in 20, 30 years, uh, we are much better off than we have been for the last 100. This is something that I would like very much to see uh, happening in the future. Well, actually talking about the, um, uh, the future, which I'm wondering which projects uh, of yours are you most excited about for the coming month? So this, I described uh, the, the current one that I'm working on, this extended study that I continued from Wong. And this is a work in progress. We are writing the paper right now, and uh, everyone has to go through the, the manuscript. This is uh, going right now. The next step will be to uh, pick up the uh, findings from this project and try to you know, be educational about it. So we don't want just to preach, this is wrong, that is wrong, and that is also wrong. We want to show people, okay, how can we do this well? So we want to help to contribute to educate and to raise researchers in the, in, in the good way. And that'll be one next step at least that I foresee for the coming months to use the findings that we are collecting now to offer some suggestions and to try to create some material that can be used in education really to help people to learn. 
to assist people. And I can tell you that this is one of my near, very short-term future plan that I have together with some colleagues. That sounds like um, a couple of very exciting months in uh, ahead of you. So happy to hear that. And um, so as usual, before we, we close up the show, I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. So first one is, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Well, perhaps the inference problem. Why can't we just get it right? Of course, we know there's a lot of wrong incentives, push, you know, pushing, steering people in the wrong direction. We know all of this. But if I had time and money with no end, I would really like to deeply understand it, um, what, why and what can we do to just get over this? I mean, enough is enough. Enough of... Uh, pretending to do serious science and we're not and when we are not doing serious science it's just wasting money wasting time hurting people that's what i would like to do if i if i if i had the chance so second question if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind dead alive or fictional who would it be that would be a mathematician mm -hmm. and that would be ramanujan i would like to if i had the privilege to sit with him for 10 to 15 minutes, I would take it right now. Because he was absolutely brilliant in an unconventional way. So it's not easy to understand who Ramanujan was because he grew differently, he learned mathematics in a different way, and he was absolutely brilliant. So if I could, that's what I would do. Well, that sounds like a, like a cool dinner to have indeed. Dinner, coffee, small snack, whatever time he would give me. <laughs> Okay, George, thanks a lot. So it was a more technical episode, but I really like doing that from time to time. I'm sure that listeners uh, learned as much as I did. I hope that we were practical. That was also the goal of the episode, like helping people understand what base factors are, what posterior odds are, what the difference uh, between all of that is and how to use that properly. And also to see the, the state of the of the debate and state of the art about using all that and the different options that people have because you like you don't have to always test hypotheses or always use posterior estimations there is a whole uh, bunch of things that, uh, that you can do and you can be very creative about that as usual i put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper thank you again George, for taking the time and being on this show. Alex, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and I really enjoyed being here. Thanks a lot. You bet. Come back anytime. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedance.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learnbasedance. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation. Yeah.